The devil, he had a book. They're trying to run me out of the ministry. You have seen it? We have prayed and prayed. I see goody good. Lord knows how many devils there are. I am innocent. I saw them eyes. We want justice. I saw nine. Everyone has heard of the Salem Witch Trials. Twenty innocent victims lost their lives. Nineteen were hanged and one was pressed to death. But why did this happen? Who was responsible? Newly discovered documents and research now shed new light on these unanswered questions. It is a time of political uncertainty. The region has no governor and little protection. Many live in mortal fear of attack from the native population. It's a little known fact that there were two major Indian wars. They had seen their families wiped out. They had seen their villages destroyed. They were terrified by the threats from the Indians. Salem was founded by English Puritans, a group of Protestant reformers in search of religious freedom. They came to America with a noble plan. The idea is to build a city upon a hill, a, a, a place that the Puritans can set the example for the rest of the world, practicing the simple Christian faith as it was originally intended. And they will play the show. At this time, Salem consists of two very distinct communities, the seaport known as Salem Town and the more rural Salem Village. It is Salem Village where our story begins. Salem Village was basically made up of yeoman farmers. They were tied to the soil, whereas in Salem Town they were more looking towards the, the sea, fishermen, merchants. Salem Village has serious problems from the start. Many residents resent being dependent on the seaport town. They have to travel seven miles just to attend church. It wanted to break off and have its own town and its own minister Salem Village earned a reputation as a volatile community. There was always this clash between the villagers and the townspeople. Finally, Salem Town allows Salem Village to form its own church. But this new independence only turns the conflict inward. Discord between the residents of Salem Village intensifies. Ideally, they should be places of peace and harmony and worship, but in reality, Puritan communities got pretty divisive. People were losing that original vigor and zeal that they had for the Puritan faith. The divide widens when the villagers cannot agree on a new minister. Factions form, one more zealous than the other. You did basically have kindling wood strewn around waiting for a match. Into this tinderbox comes an outsider, a newly ordained minister. His name, Samuel Paris. Paris was born in England and educated at Harvard in Boston. He has only recently entered the ministry. The position he is offered at Salem Village will be his first. He's failed as a sugar planter in the Barbados, where most people profited. He's failed as a merchant in Boston, where most people have become wealthy. He's attended Harvard, but hasn't graduated. So here he is in Salem Village, and this is his, really his last chance to succeed. Samuel Paris walks into a huge factional conflict in Salem Village that had been going on for decades. But for Paris, there is no turning back. He can't fail at this, because if he does, I think he, he feels he's really kind of failed at life. Paris quickly becomes friends with a wealthy and prominent Salem Village resident, Thomas Putnam. Welcome, Mr. Paris. I mean, I've been around for several more years, but on the phone? Oh, of course, always. But, uh, you know, when I try to do my best with, I don't know, uh, you know, 
shoot them and get them dressed with an evil for having him used to <laughs> When he gains the Putnams as his allies and protectors, a large, prominent family in Salem Village, he also inherits their enemies as his enemies. When you become members of this new covenant, you will become God's visible saints. I now bring you God's holy sacraments. Paris sets out to build up his new congregation. To do this, he needs new members. Paris decides to go back to stricter Puritan ways. You do not have a fully covenanted church, but only temporary preachers. As your first ordained minister, I bring you God's holy sacraments. He was hoping for a religious revival. He was genuinely hoping to convert the people of Salem Village and get them to become full members of the church. He wasn't willing to settle for a halfway solution. Forget your quarrels over your previous ministers. When you become members of this new covenant, you will become God's visible saints, able to partake of the Lord's Supper and holy baptism. At first, the strategy appears to work. 27 people join the village church. Paris begins baptizing the children of new members. Surprisingly, the membership of the church doubles. They grow and prosper. But then things start to go wrong for the new minister. People who were not members of the church couldn't have their children baptized and couldn't take communion. We will now consecrate the bread and the wine. The reprobate, the non-members are excused. The congregation that were not members had to leave while the members stayed to take communion. Membership begins to fall off. <laughs> the congregation begins to shrink. The villagers begin to rebel. All residents of Salem Village are required to pay the minister's salary even the non-church members who do not embrace the stricter rules. Resentment builds, and the village divides into two camps, church members and non-members. So you have the village committee and the non-members of the church fighting the minister. Under growing pressure, Paris defends his position from the pulpit. In little over a year, our little congregation has grown from 25 to 52 members. It has prospered in the past year and a half. But now it does not. Now no one among you stands up before the congregation to tell how God's grace has worked in your lives. Several church members are also staying away from the Lord's table. Instead of the peacemaker the village desperately needs, Paris pushes church members and non-members further apart. Anytime he had a person who wasn't giving him his way in the village, he tended to believe that that was an enemy. The minister's opponents try to force him out. They gain control at the village meeting and vote to cut off his pay. We have the inhabitants deciding whether or not they're going to begin to collect rates for the minister's salary. And as you can see down here, it says it was voted in the negative. The residents who oppose Paris do more than take away his pay. 
They also cut off his supply of firewood, a necessity for surviving the New England winters. Even his possession of his home, the village parsonage is challenged. Paris fights back. Our complaint will say that the village has refused to pay your salary and supply your firewood. That the village has let our meeting house fall into disrepair. <coughs> that opponents of the church have even persuaded some church members to join them. The village also challenges my ownership to the parsonage. Brethren, you know the village has elected new members to the tax committee, and none are members of the congregation. They are trying to run me out of the ministry, just as they did with their previous ministers. They now refuse to pay my salary, and I am also running out of firewood. Magistrate Coleman brought a new supply for me this morning. The village now challenges my ownership of the parsonage. But I am your ordained minister, and I am here to stay. You elders of the church will send a formal complaint to the court to make the village pay my salary. His sermons take on an ominous tone. Satan's design is to set up his own worship. Paris effectively casts the conflict between himself and his opponents into one of good against evil, God against Satan. Satan himself, he says, is using his opponents to attack the church. The rhetoric begins to have an effect. Paris's sermons created a dark and foreboding atmosphere in which suspicions of witchcraft could flourish. Tensions in Salem Village had really kind of reached a boiling point over issues of, of religion, of economics, of, of, of warfare, you name it. It was the time was right for something horrible to happen like witchcraft. In this highly sphere, the beggar, Sarah Good, comes to the minister's home to ask for food. Sarah Good was a beggar, a very poor woman who went from house to house. So when people refused to give her what she asked for, she would go away cursing them and muttering and uh, so they could think she was cursing them as a witch. As Good turns to go, she mumbles something. Paris believes she has uttered a curse. The words may have been nothing more than innocent grumbling, but something evil has started. A malignant idea that will spread through Salem and engulf all of Essex County. The mass hysteria that the world will come to know as the Salem Witch Hunt is about to begin. witchcraft accusations began right here. This is the foundation of the home of the Reverend Samuel Paris. This is where it all began. On the very same spot where Paris believes Sarah Good uttered a curse, his niece Abigail Williams begins to exhibit disturbing behavior. to act strangely. fits, the girls name their tormentors, the village beggar Sarah Good, and a disreputable woman, Sarah Osborne. As news of the children's strange behavior spreads, so does the outbreak itself. The next to act strangely are 12-year-old Anne Putnam and 18-year-old Elizabeth Hubbard. The girls' afflictions and convulsions seem to mirror the very demonic assault that Paris was preaching about in his sermons. Rumors spread. 
the cause of the girl's affliction must be witchcraft. We have prayed and prayed for three weeks waiting for God to act, but for too long. We want justice. The, the children have named the suspects and they should be tried in court. Tituba, an Indian slave, becomes the third suspect. Tituba is one of two Native American slaves that Paris brought to Salem Village. The ownership of slaves in early colonial New England is not unusual, but rare for a Puritan minister. Tituba is a somewhat enigmatic character. Where no one's ever really been able to figure out why she did what she did. Other than that, as a slave, she usually did what her master wanted her to do because that's what slaves learned how to do. Tituba and Putnam screamed out last night that your specter had a knife and was going to cut off her head. Tell me what you did. Confess it to me. I cannot tell. I cannot tell. I cannot tell. They, they will kill me if I tell. You will be examined tomorrow by the magistrates. The magistrates want a confession. A full confession will save you from immediate trial. You will tell! You will tell! You will tell! Some scholars believe Paris might have had a motive for forcing Tituba to confess. He wanted to become like Cotton Mather. Cotton Mather had become famous in uh, Massachusetts for uh, describing the afflictions of the Goodwin children in Boston. We have already examined Sarah Good and Sarah Osborne. They have denied they are witches. Tell us who it is who hurts the girls. The devil for all I know. I mean, to pinch and prick it! Ow! Ow! Tell us what you know about the devil. Mr. The devil, he came to me in Mr. Paris' house. He appeared like a man, dressed in black clothes. He came from Boston with two women, and they fly through the air on poles. I saw the shapes of Goody Good and Goody Osborne in the house, but Mr. Paris, he cannot see them. The devil, he had a book. Book? What book? It was a small book. He kept it in his pocket. Did he ask you to write your name in the book? He told me he would kill me if I did not sign my name in the book. He made me sign with blood from my finger. Did you see any other names in the book? I saw their marks. How many? I saw nine. Nine? You know only of Good and Osborne. There are seven witches in this village to be discovered. This, this is a conspiracy against the village. Tituba's confession introduces a new idea, one of a widespread satanic network. The magistrates, led by John Hathorne, quickly focus on this expanded threat. For one thing, she was the first person to confess to being a witch, so people understood that there were witches. But secondly, she said there were nine other witches. The devil Convinced there is a vast demonic conspiracy, the, the magistrates question the afflicted girls urging them to name more suspects. My husband, my nurse, do you not see her? Why, there she stands! Good my nurse is trying to make me sign the devil's book. I won't, I won't, I won't. Take it! I do not know what book it is. I am sure it is not God's book. Tis the devil's book, God, I know. Soon after the examinations of Good, Osborne, and Tituba, the elderly Rebecca Nurse is also accused and brought before the magistrates. Anne Putnam and 
Abigail Williams. They complain of you having hurt them. What do you say to it? God knows I have not hurt them. Do you think these suffer voluntary or involuntary? I cannot tell. That is strange. Everyone can judge. I must be silent. They accuse you of hurting them. And if you think it is not unwilling, but by design, then you can think of them as your murderers. And Putnam, go and touch her hand. And if this touch stops the child's affliction, then you, goody nurse, must be considered a witch. I cannot tell what to think. I can say, before my eternal father, I am innocent. The touch test is easily manipulable um, by anyone, by the person who is doing the touching, who then is healed from her affliction, or by the magistrate. The touch test became the crucial physical manifestation of witchcraft during the Salem witchcraft episode. We must not believe all that these distracted children say. We have to understand that the magistrates believed that everyone who came before them was guilty. And what they were trying to do was to seek evidence of that guilt. One of the key questions for historians is why the magistrates believed these young girls. They came from the most prominent families in Salem Village. The influential Thomas Putnam, a close friend of Paris, takes it upon himself to write many of the depositions against the accused. Putnam is supposed to write down exactly what is said by the accusers, but does he? You can really see very quickly that this ink is different from that ink. This is lighter than that. What's going on? Maybe the obvious thing is that he ran out of ink and just got more. But we look at this, and this text here changes. In this case, the ink is dark up here and light down here. And you can see that it changes right on the same words, also on the 18th. And looking across all the 120 depositions of Thomas Putnam, we see this happen again and again, that there is something added to the end of a lot of these depositions. This wasn't that he ran out of ink. It was that he was adding text to make this particular evidence much more effective and convicted in court. So what did the accusers actually say? We don't really know what the original accusations were. So how do you defend against that? We the people who were being so accused hard. were really fighting See, Thomas Putnam because he was reshaping all of these accusations. The accused are given no defense at all. They stand alone against a legal system determined to find them guilty. It was a perfect system for convicting witches. The examinations and denunciations begin in earnest. The magistrates ask questions designed to elicit the answers needed for a conviction. Hathorne would ask leading questions, and of course, the answer to the question is already in the question itself. The confessor said exactly what the magistrate wanted them to say. News of the accusations is spread by the most basic form of mass media, gossip. There's no television, there's no Twitter, there's no internet, there's no newspapers. And the only way you'd learn about something like this would be from gossiping with your neighbors. The accusations take on a life of their own. The girls are summoned to other towns to root out witches. But what did the young women at the center of the hysteria actually believe? Those who were the refugees first were, I believe, suffering from what we would today call post-traumatic stress syndrome. Yeah, we can see that a few of them were doing things at time for sport, but they were on the periphery. People like Ann Putnam, I think, were actually very much afflicted and affected. At first, they were genuinely afraid. 
But when they became part of the prosecution as witnesses, they were playing a role. And in that role, they were taking their cues from the magistrates. Today's historians recognize that the afflicted girls were both victims and instruments of the prosecution. At first, the accused are the most defenseless members of Salem Village, the Indian slave Tichiba and the penniless Sarah Good. But as the panic spreads, people of means and property are named as suspect. The number of accusations exploded. Arrests are made. By May of 1692, jails in Ipswich, Salem, Charlestown, and Boston are filled with nearly 50 suspects accused of witchcraft. The number of the accused will swell to more than 150. Then, the chief magistrate in charge of the witchcraft proceedings makes a crucial decision about the kind of evidence the court will allow. One of the great legal mistakes was William Stoughton's, the Chief Justice's decision to make spectral evidence, evidence which was invisible to anyone but the accusers, the central kind of evidence to prove guilt. When the accusers claim to see specters of their tormentors, the court is to consider it as hard evidence against the accused. Mr. Corwin, I have just... Magistrates Hathorne and Corwin must apply this ruling and other equally damning instructions in their deliberations. Do not mind whether the bodies of the said afflicted are not always and constantly tortured, pined, wasted, and consumed. You are to mind only whether the afflicted tend to suffer as you see them in court. This means we must find the defendants guilty if they appear afflicted. Yes. There is little motivation for government officials and ministers in Boston to question the court's proceedings. The ministers of Massachusetts were closely allied to the magistrates, all of whom were in their congregations. And so they did not want to come out and criticize them openly. With the witchcraft prosecutions, all the tensions that plagued Salem Village, the fear of Indian attacks, political uncertainty, the conflicts with Salem Town and their ministers, find a new focus. Salem Village is still a community at war with itself, but now with a common enemy. The trials begin that summer drawing huge crowds of spectators impatient to see the witches condemned. 53 people confess to acts of witchcraft to save themselves from immediate trial and execution. The number of accusations rises and spreads across a wider area. More than 25 different towns claim to have infestations of witches. It is the most widespread outbreak ever to occur outside Europe. The first execution occurs in June. This rocky promontory on the side of Gallows Hill was the site of the executions. The gallows was set up here in view of the crowds. Nineteen accused witches go to their deaths. One man, Giles Corey, refuses to enter a plea and is pressed to death. The jails are crowded with more than 150 suspects awaiting their fate. Only now, with the prospect of nearly endless executions, do some begin to question the legitimacy of the prosecutions. As the trials wore on, there began to be more and more criticism. Some of them from ministers who were very concerned about the way evidence was being treated in court, and also from Thomas Brattle, a merchant who fancied himself as something of an intellectual. The general court is about to meet in Boston, and they need to hear not only of the theological mistakes of the court, as pointed out by Mr. Mather, but also of the court's legal blunderings. So they will put a stop to these absurd trials. 
a brattle and increased matter, went to see a number of the women who had confessed to being witches in the jail. They asked them why they had confessed, and many of the women said that they had in effect been coerced. Mr. Mather, my report on interviews with confessed witches in Salem prison. Some of the Boston ministers finally urged the Reverend Increase Mather, the most respected religious leader in Boston, to investigate the prosecutions. The Salem Witch Trials ended when Boston's leading minister and theologian, the Reverend Increase Mather, uh, launched his argument that spectral evidence was too unreliable. Governor William Phipps shuts down the witchcraft court in late October of 1692. The witchcraft hysteria has come and gone, all in a single whirlwind year. But the aftermath drags on. A new court tries and acquits all the remaining defendants. It will take five more months to clear the jails. In 1693, Tituba is released and sold to a new master. The trials are over. But in Salem Village, deliberations continue over whether Samuel Paris should remain as minister. The village is divided. Some of the village accused... Paris is made to answer the many questions about his role in promoting the prosecutions. ...or Abigail Williams and directed others to them to know who afflicted the people in their illnesses. I did indeed ask some of the afflicted who it was that afflicted the others, and in this I fear I may have acted unlawfully. You were the beginner and procurer of the sorest afflictions. I am abundantly persuaded that God has suffered the evil angels to delude us on both hands about what is right and what is wrong in the matter. And how far either way is above me to say. In 1697, in a way he had never expected, Paris finally unites the long-divided Salem village. His dissolution congregation joins with the rest of the village and tells Paris he must leave. Slowly, the wounds of the once deeply fractured village begin to heal. In 1710, local courts begin the task of clearing the names of the executed and condemned. But it will be a slow process. Not until the 20th century does the state exonerate the majority of the accused. The last five victims are vindicated in 2001. More than 300 years later, the world has not forgotten the witch trials of 1692. Today, Salem Village is known as the town of Danvers, here, a memorial stands immortalizing the names of those who were victims of the Salem Witch Trials, including those who went to their deaths proclaiming their innocence. So what have we learned from these tragic events? The Salem Witch Trials were caused by failure of community, failure of religion, and failure of government. It took a confluence of huge factors to come together to create the tragedy that was Salem in 1692. We today have to confront in our own way witch hunts that still occur, and we have to confront them with a clear vision and bravery. I think the lesson of Salem for us today is to be careful not to overreact and to be careful to maintain a balance.